Hello, and welcome to Fundamentals of Loop Playing, Episode 2. My name is Loudon Schuett, and today we're going to talk about how to sit with the loop. Now, while I wish that this video could be very simple and very short, and I could just show you a, a quick uh, sort of hack to holding the loop, the truth is it's much more complicated than that. Um, one of the reasons for that is that when we say lute, we're actually talking about a large group of instruments. Even within the category of Renaissance lute, we're talking about A lutes, little tiny A lutes. We're talking about G lutes, like I have. We're having six courses, seven courses, eight courses, nine courses, ten courses. So we're talking about different sizes, different shapes, and then we have to match this with different bodies, different seats, different sitting positions, different right hand techniques. Now, in the next episode, in episode three, we're going to talk about the variety of right-hand techniques that were used in the 16th century and early 17th century. And depending on what repertoire you're playing and what right-hand technique you've chosen, you may find that your sitting position needs to change. The angle of the neck will need to change. And we'll um, demonstrate some of those for you today so you can sort of see, well, okay, if I'm doing thumb out, if I'm doing valet, let's say, you know, early 17th century Renaissance repertoire, and I choose to do thumb out position uh, as he, um, as he played, you may find that the neck is going to be in a very different position than if you're playing Spinachino from the early 16th century. We're talking 1507 is uh, when his publication came out. So there, there's a wide range of sitting positions, a wide range of instruments. And so my goal with this episode is to give you some tools to experiment, to find a sitting position in conjunction with your teacher. Um, and if you don't have a teacher, I would definitely recommend um, at least reaching out to more experienced players, showing them your sitting position. Um, also, if reflecting on your sitting position from time to time, um, s sitting in front of a mirror and looking at yourself, paying attention to how you're feeling. We're going to go over a lot of those things. Um, but let's start with some of the issues that arise with sitting with a lute. Now, many of you I know have probably started with a guitar. Some of you haven't, and in that sense, you may be uh, at an advantage. I started on classical guitar, and the classical guitar sitting position is, is kind of nice. It's very uniform at this point. I would say you'll see some variety with what people use to hold the instrument up. You'll see um, these frames that'll hold the instrument up. I have a cushion somewhere. You can put a cushion down so that you don't have to lift your leg. But I would say that 90% of classical guitar players I see out there, professionals, non-professionals, they're using a footstool, which is what I've got here. This can be ordered online, um, Amazon. You can get it at a guitar center. Very easy to find these footstools. Um, they're not very expensive, but what they do is they raise the foot. You also notice that my seat here is essentially a piano bench or a music stand. This also can be ordered on Amazon. I need a new one. This one's pretty squeaky and it's getting to be kind of annoying um, when I do recordings because I can hear all the, the little noises. But these are kind of some essential elements that you will probably want to start with. We'll talk about some other things like straps um, as, we, as we progress through this video. But as you can see with the classical guitar, um, this is sort of the standard position. You might notice some players will go even higher with their footstool. Do this. And they've got it really high up. And in that sense, it's kind of giving an advantage to the right hand or the left hand, depending on how low or high it is. Or they might go a little bit lower. Um, one thing you'll notice about the classical guitar compared to the lute is that the classical guitar has a flat back. And in a lot of ways, this makes it really, really nice. You can just sort of set the guitar and it, it mostly stays. You might need a shelf liner like this to kind of get a little extra hold on your legs. These shelf liners can be purchased from Lowe's, Home Depot, online on Amazon. Um, they were initially designed so you could put them up on top of like fireplaces. You can put porcelain um, sort of uh, figurines and things and that way they don't fall. And here we go. We've got this really nice sitting position where my hands can lift up. Now, this is classical guitar, and maybe some of you have, have come from this, and it's like, oh, this is really nice. And you've chosen now to play the lute. Now, the lute, um, and we will go into this in far greater detail in future um, 
videos, but the lute is essentially a descendant of the Middle Eastern oud. And one thing that lutes have in common is this rounded back. Um, and this does create some issues because when you put this rounded back against your chest, and let's say you're playing something, it is very easy for the, the instrument to pop this way. And you go, well, why, why was it designed that way? Um, I think there are probably a couple different theories. The one that I kind of um, ascribe to is the idea that these instruments were most likely played sitting on the ground. And if you're sitting on the ground and you're cross-legged like this, suddenly you've got this wonderful bowl that you can play the instrument in, just like this. I don't know if the mic is picking up the lute now that I've moved here very well, but this is just a very comfortable place to play, and you can have the neck a little more elevated, you can have it lower. So if you're sitting on a, um, a rug or a blanket and in a tent or in a palace, um, this is a really comfortable position. And you'll see sitar players, modern oud players, um, you'll see other rounded back Middle Eastern and Oriental uh, instruments played in that manner, which is essentially on the ground or on a pillow or on a rug. And when the instrument sort of became westernized and it became the lute, we see from the iconography and we see in our modern lives that the lute more often is going to be played in a sitting or standing position. Um, so we have to deal with this rounded back and there are a number of different ways we can do that. I think the, the most important thing to take away from this video is that there isn't one answer. There isn't one absolutely correct answer. It may be the best answer for you. You may find a sitting position with your instrument for you that works great, but you find you, you have a friend who's a foot taller than you or a foot shorter than you or has a different right hand position and suddenly that doesn't work at all. So if I were to give you one overall message in this video it would be that you should experiment, you should reflect, and I'm going to show you a bunch of different ways that you can sit with the lute. Um, one thing I have noticed with students, particularly uh, in the beginning stages of their training, is they'll sit down with an instrument and that's it. That's the way they're stuck. They kind of, the first way they sit with the instrument, they come in, they sit down, they have a sitting style, maybe it's the sort of cross-legged thing here, or maybe it's, a, uh, but the point is, is that they, they kind of get stuck. And whenever you take them out of that sitting position, they're very uncomfortable and they go right back to their old way. I would fight that as much as you can and take some time intermittently to experiment with different sitting positions because uh, it can change the angle of the strings, it can change your sound, it can make things physically easier for you. Um, one of the reasons we look for a good sitting position, of course, is so that we don't injure ourselves. In particular, we're worried about our shoulders, we're worried about our uh, lower back, our upper back. Um, you can even end up hurting uh, your arms or your legs. So I think my overall message to you, and I'll reiterate this at the end of the video, is that you should experiment you should intermittently try other things, particularly if you're changing techniques, and reflect on how well it's going. Write it down. So many of you will notice that I've also got this um, other thing attached to my lute. This is just a, a lute strap, and there are a number of strap makers out there. It can tie it to the head stock there. And then if you have a pin here, you can attach there and that's kind of nice and some of these straps will come with an extra long string at the end called a bassoon strap or a butt strap and this just gives you something to sit on for a little extra stability I don't have that and that's just because um, for the way I'm playing right now I don't want the angle of my neck quite as high um, but that's certainly an option you can find strap makers on Etsy you can google loot strap making there's a couple um, companies that will produce these and they're, they're quite pretty and get different things. But the idea is to just add a little more security. So um, let's start from perhaps the, the simplest way to, to hold the lute. And this is a way that I um, 
will sometimes or often often play in this way and I really enjoy it and I will talk about the positive benefits of each position and I'll talk about the negative benefits of each position so um, obviously the simplest thing is no strap so I won't attach the strap here no strap and you can sit with the loot like this with this leg crossed and you'll see uh, I know Paul Odette who was my former teacher uh, for a while in some videos he on that are available on YouTube I think in the late 80s 80s early 90s he was playing a lot without a footstool and he was just crossing his leg and you'll see lots of players do this still um, and this is a nice position again it recreates that uh, a little bit of that bowl uh, that you saw when I was sitting on the ground it's not quite as secure um, so you may find that shelf liners on the legs will add that that extra security I, I will say that you should always experiment with the material of the pants you are wearing because I've had situations where I practice in my PJ bottoms and my lute did absolutely fine it was sitting it was really nice and then I put on my my concert dress pants and the lute is slipping around like crazy so if you're going to do a performance um, I would always check to see how well the material of your pants holds the loot. Um, that can be awful, awfully surprising if you get out on stage and suddenly your, your loot is sliding around. So this position is really nice. It's very simple. Um, there are a couple negative elements to this position. I have found that my leg tends to fall asleep. Um, my my ankle kind of uh, I lose circulation here and there is a tendency to bowl over the instrument so to bend the back and I'll show that from a different angle so if I'm sitting here and I've got a loop like this I do have to be a little conscious so that I'm not and this can be really really easy to get into this position if you're reading your music if you're performing and you're reading your music or you're practicing you may start off in this kind of nice higher position here and then end up bowled over and looking down and that can cause some back problems um, and that's something to be aware of now that's with the left leg crossed one of the other options obviously is that you cross the right leg um, this position I feel is a little nicer for the right hand because the lute is a little more level. Um, when we're talking about thumb under, and in the next video we're gonna we're gonna go into these hand positions in greater detail and what it means. But thumb under is essentially a position where the thumb goes underneath the index finger. So you can see that my arm is doing this. Thumb out is a position where the thumb is over the index finger. And we'll talk about that as well. For thumb under positions, I've found for me, and they're obviously for you, it may be slightly different, that a lower neck, it's easier to get a better sound with the right hand. And then with a slightly raised neck is better for thumb out positions. And I should clarify that we will continue to talk about sitting positions in the next episode when I talk about right hand. So if you're confused about what thumb under is versus thumb out, I think these two videos may be worth, you know, watching video three, coming back to video two, rewatching video three. So I think they're, wor they're going to be worth sort of reviewing and analyzing um, and, and not just consuming in one, one view. If you only watch them once, I think you may miss things or some things may be a little more confusing than they need to be. And also keep in mind that um, in a normal lesson scenario, I would, you'd be sitting across from me and you'd ask me, oh, well, what do you mean? And I would, I would answer that. And uh, since that's not possible, this is a pre-recorded video, I'm sort of thinking ahead to what are the possible questions that are going to arise. Now in this sitting position, with the right leg up, I this tends to be what I prefer personally for me with this instrument, um, which is a six course G lute. And I find this to be very nice for the right hand. I'm a little less likely to bowl over um, just because the lute is a little higher and up against my, my chest. So there's still a possibility for bowling over, but I find that it's a little less likely. So I'm trading a little bit of stability 
for um, maybe a little bit better uh, health outcomes. So my, my back is there. Now, I can help improve the stability by adding the strap in. And then we add the strap in, and suddenly I feel a little more secure. And this can also be used in the previous position. You can use a strap here. I, I actually find it a little less useful in this position, um, just because the strap sort of pulls the instrument away from the bowl that you've created here with your legs. But again, everybody's body is different, so it's, it's worth getting the strap and experimenting with it. Um, the next sitting position that I see some players do, and to be honest, I have only ever used a few times um, just because I'm not particularly comfortable with it, I'm used to being more secure, is you will see players who don't have any leg up, and they do it quite successfully. Um, this is kind of a, a, an interesting position. They Sometimes they have a bassoon strap and sometimes they don't, and they're just playing with the loop like this and getting a little more, their arms, their right arm tends to be a little bit lower and they're holding the instrument as they play. And it's, from a, a sort of um, physical perspective, it's awfully nice because both your legs are flat on the ground. Um, there's nothing potentially harming your lower back. I, for the life of me, I, I like to play really complex music, and I'm not saying that other people can't in this position, but for me, when I try to play bars and other things, that bowl action of the lute just swings out for me. Um, I suspect that they have some tricks with holding the right arm just a little bit lower and really keeping it there. I think it's also going to depend on how shallow or how deep the curve on the back is. If you have a shallower instrument, it might be a little easier to hold that up. This is a fairly rounded back, and I find that um, I just need a little more um, security when holding the lute, having it uh, in that, that kind of position. So that may be something worth experimenting with. It may be a little more secure with a bassoon strap on, on your strap. It may be... Um, great for certain repertoires. So for example, if you're not playing a lot of bar chords, but you're playing just some single line trebles. But I just, for me, it's a little, a little too much um, movement. Uh, and I think I'd much rather have a leg up, have things a little more secure as I'm, as I'm playing. Um, that I just, for me, stability is really important. Now that all said, sometimes we get into scenarios where we have to play a gig or we have to play in front of people and we have to stand. And you know, when you're standing like this, I don't know if I'm in the camera right now, um, I'll sort of just show this and then sit back down, but you know, getting used to playing up like this. Uh, a friend of mine from years ago, Brian Kay, I always see him uh, playing and standing and singing and I'm always, always very impressed. So it may be, depending on what your goals are, if you're a, a singer loop player and you want to be able to stand and sing and play, that may be a position that um, you, you may want to experiment with. For smaller instruments, I have seen um, some very unique and unusual strap systems that can be sort of attached to the chest and hold the instrument a little more securely. I've only seen it with uh, Renaissance guitar and I think maybe an A lute. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to see if something like that might be available for a larger lute, but I, I have not seen that. Um, now let's talk about some of the, I think, I think those positions are really nice in particular for the thumb under technique. So if you're watching video three and you're learning about thumb under right hand technique and you want to review what sitting positions are maybe most comfortable for that, I think those one, two, three, four positions are probably the best. Um, when we sit with the lute, bear in mind there's a sort of unlimited number of 
of varieties or subcategories depending on how you angle the neck. So for example, we take this one position where I have the lute like this. Could change it a little bit by putting the neck up or change it. You'll see this in iconographic sources where the lute is actually angled a little bit down. Not necessarily something I'm super comfortable with having the neck angled down, but I'm trying to be open-minded and it may actually make it easier. We'll talk about this in, in left hand technique to reach over with the thumb, which is we know something that they did. Um, so there's, there's a sort of range, right, as you lift the neck and you do that. The other thing to be aware of in any sitting position is where the headstock is compared to you. So we've got a couple different angles. Um, when I'm using thumb under technique, it's sort of dictated by where my right arm lays. And I think it's going to depend on your body. Um, the honest truth is that I wish I could give you a, a solid do this and everything will be great. Um, but for every individual sitting in front of me, I'd probably have a slightly different answer depending on their physiology. So it's something worth experimenting with. Um, let's talk about these, well, at least with, with some of these positions. If you don't like crossing your leg, if you don't like um, losing that circulation, um, you can also use the footstool with the lute. And there are a couple different ways to do it. One of the most common um, ways is you take the footstool and you put it, one, one thing lower, um, underneath the right leg. And again, this is very similar to this position. But let's say your leg falls asleep, you don't like maybe what that does to your back, you don't like having your leg crossed, then a footstool can be really, really nice. And you can really control the height. You get a little more variety, right? I can really come up against the instrument this way. Now, what I found for me is that you do lose a little bit of stability with this. So you may find that you want to be choosy about what type of pants you wear or whether you use a shelf liner or not. And this may also be improved with a, with a fairly long um, bassoon strap. I like this position. Um, my two most common positions that I use for um, thumb under uh, sort of early to, to mid 16th century technique is I'll either use this position or I will use the leg crossed position. Um, I wish I could tell you that I preferred one over the other. It tends to depend on what I'm sitting on and uh, sort of what I'm playing. Um, if my leg needs a rest, I have the footstool. So I kind of alternate between the two. Um, the footstool on the other side, I think is a little more rare, uh, especially in, uh, especially for thumb under and in, in lute sort of playing. But I, I don't want to throw it out. Um, this is going to be, when we talk about thumb out and we have that thumb out like this and the hand may be a little closer to the bridge this position with the neck much higher becomes a great way to to play in that style and we'll talk about this more in the next video but i think it's it's really really important for everyone to understand that there was not a single in, you know, unified right hand technique in the 16th century. Even um, fairly early on, there were a variety of right hand techniques being used, and we have evidence of this. Certainly, um, thumb under, as we'll talk about in the next video, was dominant, but um, it is important to understand that there were players that were doing thumb out, and there were players that were doing unusual things. Francesco da Milano was using finger thimbles to get more sound and attaching, you know, bird quills to it. You know, I have a yellow naped Amazon parrot and he's always providing me these sort of picks. So um, keep an open mind as we progress. I, I think what's happened perhaps in the loot community is everyone wants an easy answer. They go, well, loot technique is this. Loot technique is thumb under. It's played in a very particular way. The fingers are all splayed out like this and that's loot technique. Um, 
and it, that doesn't actually add up. We have sources like Cavalcanti in the, the early 1590s, 1591, where they're already using M and I alternation. Um, we have descriptions by Nicola Vallée saying that the only people who still play Thumb Under by the time he's published his books and writing about it are the old German guys. Everyone else is doing Thumb Out. We know Doland, uh, in the middle of his life, switched to Thumb Out. Um, I, I think being open-minded and exploring different things um, is going to be an important part of this course of all of these episodes, is that there isn't one answer. There may be one answer that works really well for you, um, but it may not necessarily be the answer for someone else. Uh, so getting in a little bit into the thumb out position, I think in general I found that thumb out... Um, I don't need the strap as much. I, I know that some people, uh, I think Nigel North for a while at least was playing with a strap thumb out. I think, I think he still is. I think I see a lot of other players um, using the, the strap in a thumb out position. This sort of uh, angled neck where it's up uh, offers a couple of other options, which I think are, are kind of nice. So you could potentially get rid of the footstools entirely, use a strap like this. And if you have a bassoon strap to secure your sitting position, you put the bassoon strap underneath, you sit on top of it, and then you've got this very nice sitting position like this. My only negative with this is depending on your body type, I feel a little far away from the instrument. I feel like my head is up here and I'm not, I, I would love it if it were a little more like this. I feel like ah, I'm, I'm in place, but that may be um, just because that's what I'm used to. And I think um, I don't want to fall into that trap. If I were playing a lot more 10 course lute, or let's say I switched to Baroque lute and I was doing some of that, I may, I may change my mind and, and be okay with being a little more distant. That might be something um, Nigel or Robert Barto or somebody like that would, would have a lot to say about because they are often playing thumb out. They're often playing later lutes. Um, but let me offer up a couple of ideas for playing thumb out in Renaissance repertoire. And like I said, you know, this may be John Dolan, this may be Valet, Ballard. Um, it uh, was likely Molinaro and Terzi um, because the thumb out position was, was definitely becoming more common on the continent a little bit earlier than it was in England. So I tend to prefer using the footstool. And I'll either, if I have a quite a low seat, um, I will take the strap off, just so that my back is, is freed up, um, and I will put shelf liner on both legs. And you can either take a position like this, which is quite nice. If you feel like the lute, like I said, is a little low, what you can actually do is use a second footstool on a lower setting. And I've, I've used this, and then suddenly you have the bowl that holds the lute. And you can play. Like that. And we'll talk about, as I said, the right hand detail, uh, right hand technique in more detail in the next episode. But um, this really gives me a chance to sort of plant the instrument. feels very secure, very natural, and you'll notice it's actually very similar to the way classical guitarists sit. And you may say, well, you know, what evidence is there that they sat this way? Um, I find it's most similar to one piece of advice that you hear on a lot of sources, which is to actually sit with the loop up against a table, and the table is holding its ear. I'm, I'm terrified of hurting the soundboard and all of that, but I think that kind of security is really nice. You're sitting up against the table and it's holding it. So I think of this as sort of a, a benign way of recreating that. There are a couple uh, paintings and drawings that show people sitting with a loop much more angled like this, kind of in a, in a modern classical um, angle, at least with the neck high and sitting very, very comfortably. I think this is a great position if you are playing thumb out repertoire. 
um, it gets rid of a lot of the fussiness, the, the body moving around and doing all of that. So to review, if you're playing a thumb out position for ballet, ballard, doland, or something like that, you can either go with a single, single foot stool secured with, with shelf liners, just knowing that that kind of lowers the instrument away from you a little bit and you'll have to wrap your arm around. And I think that comfort level is going to depend on how shallow the back is. If the, if the back is a little more shallow, then it may be a really comfortable thing. But if it's rounded like mine, you may be more comfortable with two foot stools bringing the instrument up. sort of summary of all of these positions is that I think you if you've just purchased a lute or maybe you've playing for a little while but you're not happy with your sitting position what I would do is I'd, I'd make sure you have a good seat step one maybe one that doesn't squeak as much as mine does um, that you have two footstools to play around with a strap and some shelf liner and honestly what I would do is I'd get a little notebook I'd sit down and I'd run through all of these positions. Um, and you could be very, very methodical about it. I would um, try taking a, a, a piece or an exercise that you're comfortable with, understanding, of course, that uh, if you play anything from away from your standard way of sitting, it's going to feel a little uncomfortable. But what you're looking for is that position that feels secure, that... Um, you can hold for a long time because if you're going to practice for an hour and you're in an uncomfortable position, let's say you're bowled over the lute and you're doing something like this, which you can certainly do, but you'll see I've got my, my toes holding my leg up, I've got my back bent over, and I think, you know, you can certainly play well in that position, but uh, you may not want to do that for an hour, hour and a half of practice, or certainly for a concert. So what we're trying to find is a secure position that allows us to play the music we're working on, um, but that we can also hold in a healthy manner. Um, and I'll, I'll say that there are a lot of people out there that are perhaps more obsessed with the healthy aspect of it than I am. People who are like, you know, we shouldn't have any risk to your back or any risk to your legs. My view on it is all about moderation. Um, I think that you, you should, probably shouldn't be practicing for eight, nine, 10 hours a day. I mean, you can, um, but if you, probably should take some breaks and go for a walk and eat and do all of those other things. So I think it's finding a position that is not going to cause any lasting any lasting damage, but is comfortable to play all of the things in. If you want to go further and look at something like the Feldenkrais technique or, or some other body awareness technique to sort of deal with problems, um, that's absolutely fine. Uh, what I found with students is that you start with a comfortable sitting position. Um, it doesn't have to be 100% perfect, but just comfortable and, and healthy, something they can do for an hour. And then really it's, it's working on the wrists and it's working on tension and getting the tension out. And once you've done that, you can reevaluate the, the sitting position. Um, the lute, like I said, presents uh, significant more difficulties than the guitar. At least I think so. I, I, when I was little, I mean, maybe somebody coming to the guitar for the first time is overwhelmed by that sort of sitting position. Or maybe somebody who's played acoustic guitar and they're switching to classical just can't get comfortable with that. Uh, from my perspective, the, the classical uh, sitting position is so much simpler. Most classical guitars are about the same size. There's a sort of... Um, universal way that people have found to sit with it for the most part. Lutes, just by the nature of the instrument, the sizes of the lutes, the, the shape of the lute, just presents uh, a number of, of more difficulties. Um, I imagine this is a video where people will comment or maybe have their own ideas about how to, to sit and do things, and I think that's wonderful. I don't think that's a problem at all. Um, and again, what I would say is that if I were working directly with a student 
it would be what would work best for that student. I'm not looking for a one-size-fits-all sitting position. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this with the footstool at you know number four height with the lute like this, this is the only way you can play Renaissance lute. The, if there are any um, overall message that you take away from this video, it's that you should experiment. Um, you should be very aware of what you're doing and um, find, work with others. You know, go to as many teachers as you can, talk to as many people as you can, throw a comment on this video, I'll throw something back. So, you know, send up, put up your own video and we'll see how you're sitting and, and maybe there's something obvious that we can, we can fix. Um, and you know, I, I, my life is a little crazy right now with a, a 17 month old, but I will always try to respond and help people as much as I can. Um, but it is a thing that's going to require some open-mindedness, some experimentation, um, going around. I tell students to be promiscuous in their uh, adventures of learning the lute. Go seek out advice from other players. Find the thing that works for you. So that's the overall message from this video. Um, there is no part of me that thinks that I hit every possible way of sitting with the lute. It's just the, not possible to cover in a single video or it would be five, six hours long and I'd have to bring in tall students and short students and it, I, I think it would still fail. So um, try out these different sitting positions. You may want to watch episode three um, before settling on, on trying one out for a couple weeks so that you can figure out maybe what right hand position is best for you. And once you've got that right hand position, you can decide, do I um, try some of the first four or five uh, ways of sitting that Loudon presented, or do I, I try some of the, the thumb out um, positions? Uh, but it's a very, very complicated and difficult uh topic to teach in a broad way and it's even worse when you have to put it in writing um i had to write a, a book for mel bay and one of the um uh sections is on sitting with the lute and you you realize that there's page limits and there's just you can only put so much information out so i hope you all find this um this episode helpful it may be episode part one of sitting with the lute and there may be a future episode where we talk about some other options. Um, certainly if we look into other instruments like the Baroque lute, um, we'll, we'll come up with some different ways of, of sitting. Uh, but toss me some comments, throw up your own videos, ask questions, um, but stay open-minded, experiment, and I'll see you for the next episode, which will be on right-hand technique. Have a good one.